Hello, you've reached Gloria and I am with Farmstead Talk and I am here today with Kira from Homestead Dreaming and Kira is representing her state of Oklahoma. Thank you for joining me today, Kira. Thank Homestead you for having interview. me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Greatly appreciated. So Kira, if you would tell me a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your family, where you're currently living. Um, well, I'm Kira and from Homestead Dreaming. I live in Northeast Oklahoma, I'm about 40 minutes north of Tulsa. And um, I'm married and have three little children, um, ages seven, six, and two. <laughs> And um, we homeschool and we uh, try to be as self-sustainable as we can. Um, I have chickens and quail and a large garden and I'm expanding every year. So, so uh, tell me a little bit about what your community looks like. Um, I live in a town of about 30,000 people, um, a little over than that. And I live downtown. Um, my immediate community is very gardeny and um, right outside of town it's all farms and farmland um, we live in the hills so it's beautiful and um, the the city that I'm in is called the gardening city so I mean everyone that I know personally has a garden <laughs> nice. Um, so would you consider yourself a, a urban homesteader then? Yes, I would consider myself an urban homesteader, yes. Okay, so what does that actually feel like to be an urban homesteader? So, uh, Well, I mean, I, I live in a house and with a yard um, about the size of most other people. I have about a fifth of an acre and um, of course my house takes up a lot of that fifth of an acre. Um, so really, it, the challenge is to try and fit um, as much as you can on a small space and trying to figure out how to utilize your space um, the best that you can to get the mo most amount out of it. Yeah, understood. Um, what kind of gardening do you do and what type of animals do you have? Um, I predominantly do raised bed gardening. I I came from central Arkansas where gardening in the ground was not really feasible unless you did a lot of amendments. Um, so that's just what I'm used to. Raised bed gardening is is what I've always done. So when we moved here, that's just what I've always been used to doing and, and works very well for me. Um, we try to utilize a, as much vertical space as we can with arch trellises and um, we are going to expand to our front space so that we can um, use it to grow food rather than grass. And um, we also have chickens and quail and the quail for now are predominantly just for eggs. Um, but ideally, um, eventually we will be able to also have them for meat. Um, the chickens are also predominantly for eggs at this point. Um, the roosters have all been food uh, for us because we are not allowed to keep them. Um, but ideally soon we will be able to vamp up that um, the chicken meat production as well as bed production and have um, more chickens be able to put in our freezer. How many chickens do you have right now, or what is your city limitations? Uh, my city limitations is six hens, and um, I can have up to, I think it's 16 pullets under the age of 10 weeks. Okay. Uh, I have six, I have, actually, I have five hens and one rooster, but my rooster um, doesn't crow. So I keep them around. What kind of um, things do you do that you would consider to be sustainable homesteading practices? Um, besides well, your gardening and your <laughs> raising of your chickens? We, um, we compost as much as we can. We try and uh, stay away from disposable products. We try and use as much cloth 
and glass and stainless steel and cast iron as possible. Um, things like single time use, like paper towels and paper plates, we, we avoid them a lot. Um, we also try to avoid single use products like diapers and um, opt for cloth diapers over disposable. And um, we, when the weather allows for it, we try to dry our clothes outside on the line rather than using the electricity. Um, we also try to bake our own breads and we brew our own kombucha, we juice. We just try to um, source our things locally that we can't produce our own things. And we're mindful about the things that we do buy from commercial stores. Um, and you also homeschool, that's huge. Yeah, yeah, we homeschool, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. And um, really, our the reason that we homeschool isn't really based on um, philosophical or religious reasons. It's just, I like my kids and I like them to be home. And I, their childhood is so short of amount of time that I want to be able to be with them and raise them the way that we want to raise them. And the, the time that they're small is such a short amount of time that I feel like sending them to school when I am home anyways, just seems like a wasted opportunity to really build that bond with, with my children. Right. Um, you touched on uh, making kombucha. So mm -hmm. do you want to share with the audience uh, what kombucha is and briefly just touch on how you actually make that and what its benefits mm -hmm. are? Um, so kombucha is a fermented sweet tea and um, it has loads of health benefits for your gut. It has natural probiotics that really helps to um, replenish your gut health after illness, antibiotics, um, really anything that that might throw off your, your internal gut health, it, it's great to keep it in balance and to keep it um, working smoothly. <laughs> um, but I have a gallon of kombucha right here where it is red. It's technically my hotel. So what you do is you brew uh, Wait, let me stop you for one second. What do you mean by when you say it's my hotel? Uh, okay, so my hotel is just um, already brewed kombucha that has um, the SCOBY, which is the mother. It's the symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. And it just stays there and that's what it lives in and feeds off of. And anytime you brew another brew, it makes another SCOBY. And so you put it in the hotel and it just it stays there so that um, you can, it's ready to be used the next time you want to brew. Um, to actually brew the kombucha though, you, um, you just brew a regular batch of sweet tea. I use green and black tea and I, I just brew a little mason jar of hot tea. And once, um, once I let it steep for about 10 minutes, I add sugar, let it dissolve and then put it in a gallon jar like this one, and then fill the rest with cool um, distilled water or filtered water. And that will bring your tea to room temperature so that you can safely add your SCOBY and one cup of this reserved tea. And that will begin your fermentation process. Um, I cover it. And the reason why I cover it is because um, it's a little acidic and it attracts gnats. And also I have pets and I don't want cat hair or dog hair or dust to get into my brew. Um, and this basically just prevents it from mold or dust and all that stuff. And it takes about um, five to seven days, depending on how warm it is in your kitchen. And then after that, your first fermentation is over. You can drink it or you can choose to bottle it in an airtight container with flavorings and it um, produces carbonation um, naturally and that's that's usually what you find in in the store is kombucha that has been um, fermented a second time and has been flavored and carbonated and that carbonation is from 
the natural bacteria and yeast feeding off of the second fermentation sugars. Um, and then also it being in an airtight container, it prevents that um, the gas from es escaping and that's what makes it carbonate. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah. I know you shared with me before that you have a passion about baking bread and that your mother, yeah. I think you said your mother, right? Was the yes. one that shared yeah. that love um, and experience with you growing up about baking different breads and that's your yes. passion. So yes. I see you're sitting in the kitchen already. So <laughs> take us along a little bit on a journey of making one of your specialty breads and what is it called and how are you it's making that today? Uh, okay, so I make artisan bread and I'm going to move the camera a little bit so I can show you exactly what I do. Um, and there's my <laughs> oven preheating. And basically, um, it's, it's an artisanal bread or artisan bread, depending on how you say it. And you start with flour in a bowl. This is three cups of flour. And then um, I use uh, yeast that I can get at the store. Um, and I use one teaspoon of yeast. Now, Kira, do you keep that yeast in the refrigerator? I do, I keep it in the refrigerator. Okay. And then I do about a teaspoon of salt. I kind of eye it. Okay. And, then we and now, Kira, do you think, is the salt actually for the purpose of baking or is it basically for taste? It or is for taste. taste. Yes. Taste only. Mm -hmm. Really, okay. the only thing that you need for this bread is flour, yeast, and warm water. Okay. And, um, I personally find that it's a little bland without salt. Okay. So, salt. Um, but it really, it's to taste, and you don't have to do any certain amount of um, salt for it to um, turn out right. It's just based on what you prefer to, the bread to taste like. Okay. And how much water were you using again? Three cups of flour, and then a teaspoon of yeast and then you want to mix it with a whisk so that it's completely combined and that yeast is evenly distributed in the flour. Um, you can do it by hand like I'm doing it or you can do it in a stand mixer. Um, it's personal preference on whether or not you have time to do it by hand or whether or not you want to um, speed up the process and do it in the mixer. It just takes a few minutes in a mixer. And if you don't have that, it's it, it. I don't want it to hinder you from making bread because it's very easy to make it by hand. Um, once you've mixed it with your whisk, you add a cup and a half of warm water, which I have right here. And you just pour it in. And you can use your hands at this point, but since I'm on here, I'm gonna use my spatula so I don't get my hands all dirty. And really you just wanna mix it until it, um, all the flour is just evenly combined. It doesn't have to look like a, a uniform dough. It doesn't have to look pretty. It really just, just so that all of the flour is moistened, um, that's all you have to do. And then you let it set. Um, with this amount of yeast, you let it set for about two to three hours before you can bake it. What was the temperature, Kira, of the water? Um, the water, it's it's warm. So I would say I don't I don't take the temperature of it. So I would say that it's warm enough that you wouldn't want to give it to a baby to drink, but not hot enough that it's steaming. Um, if it's too hot, then you risk uh, killing off the yeast and it won't make your bread rise at all. Um, and the idea behind having it be warm is that the yeast enjoys warmth, but not too much, if that makes sense. So right now, okay, so you got it mixed just generally mixed up and then are you kneading are you i see you did a slight kneading of the dough yes and it's just uh just enough to get all of the flour in incorporated i still have a little bit um dried on the bottom 
that I would want it to be like a good shaggy type of dough. And then I would cover it with plastic. And the reason why I cover it with plastic rather than a towel is again, I have animals and kids and it's just easier to prevent contamination. And I, I realize that plastic isn't exactly um, sustainable, but I have not found anything that um, keeps pet hair and dust out quite like plastic does, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, it gives you a good seal. It does, yes. So then you just cover it and let it set for about two hours. You know, one thing I, I forgot to say to you when we, with your introduction is, um, where can people find you on social media? You want to share with them real quick where they can find you on social media? Absolutely. Um, so on, on um, Instagram, I am homestead.dreaming. On YouTube and on Facebook, I'm just Homestead Dreaming. And um, on Twitter, I'm Homestead Dream One. <laughs> okay, I didn't want to leave that out. I know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so while the bread is baking, um, just wanted to touch base on just something that I like to ask all my interviewees is, um, how do you, do you feel like spirituality or religion has uh, impacted you and your journey with homesteading at all? Um, personally, no. Spirituality and religion doesn't really play a big role in our, our desire to homestead. We're not very religious. We're not very spiritual. Um, our main focus on wanting to homestead is really um, health. And um, I, I have some dietary restrictions based on some um, health things that happened a long time ago, which is what originally catapulted my um, desire to learn more healthful foods and eat more healthful foods. And that um, made me realize how expensive those things can be. And um, that led me to wanting to find um, alternatives and how can I do things myself to um, to make better food for my family and for myself without spending an arm and a leg to do it, so to speak. Right. right. And I think as homesteaders, we're, you know, that is one inspiration to all of us is that we want to know where our food comes from. Exactly. And we want to eat healthy. You know, yes. we, we never know what's in our food that we're buying at grocery stores. So. Right. Even, um, things, go even ahead. things that look like whole foods aren't necessarily as um, healthy as we think they might be due to additives that we can't readily see. Absolutely. On. Absolutely. I'm looking at the back of your counter again, so I forgot to ask you. So how long does that dough have to rise for? Um, so the dough has to rise for about two hours. Okay, so the dough rises for two hours, and then once it's r risen, do you have to re-knead it again? Um, you shape it into a ball and put it into the uh, into the pot, which my oven just said that it was ready to be preheated, so I will show you exactly how that happens. Okay. So, um, now that my oven is preheated, I already had some dough pre-mixed. So this is what it looks like after it's risen. So that's after it's risen for, two, the, the, it went through the two hour rising period? Exactly. So then you just kind of take the, the dough off of the sides and shape it into a little kind of like a blob. And then you very carefully take the hot Dutch oven out of the oven and I'll show you that. So while your oven is preheating, you also want to preheat your um, your pot, which is what your <laughs> which is what your dough will be baked in. So this is my cast. So iron. you don't just put it in a regular like pan and put it in the oven then. Uh, no, you could, 
You could, but then you would have to add um, an, a second pan with two cups of water to create the steam. Um, the reason why I use a cast iron Dutch oven with a lid is because it creates um, a seal and it steams the outside of the crust of the bread. So here in this little shaker, I have flour and I'm just gonna flour the bottom of my cast iron Dutch oven. And the reason why I do that is to prevent the dough from sticking to the bottom. So then I take this blob of very sticky dough and I carefully plop it into the bottom of my pot. And I will show you what it looks like here in just a second. So you don't put no oil or flour on that before removing it from the bowl into the Dutch oven? I do not, know. I just flour the bottom of my pot and then plop the dough in there. And then it kind of looks like that. And it's very liquid. It's, I like a, based on your taste, you can add or uh, like not use as much um, oop, you gotta put the lid on it, hold on. Um, based on your particular tastes, you can, um, you can use less water and you will have a more uh, dense dough. Um, I like um, like a more chewy type of dough, if that makes sense. So I, I tend yeah. to use just a little bit more water and it's le a less, um, it's less of a structured dough. It's more of like a, almost like a batter, like a, a more, cons a, a little thicker batter. Um, and so when I plop it in there, it doesn't hold its shape. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't hold its shape because of the amount of water that I use. So for three cups of flour, I use a cup and a half of water. Um, if you were wanting to use, um, if you were wanting to have a slightly more dense of a dough, you could use um, one and a quarter cup or one and um, a third cup rather than one and a half. And it would give you um, a less sticky dough and more of a structured dough. I know that not everybody likes the dough to be more moist. Um, the bread to come out more moist, but I prefer it that way. And um, it creates more steam, so the crust is very, very crunchy, and the inside is very soft. Sounds delicious. I know I've seen pictures of your bread, and they look <laughs> beautiful. And I know you have all different types of recipes. Where can, where can one find all your recipes? Um, all my recipes, well, most of my recipes are on my YouTube channel. There, I have an entire playlist called um, Homemade Bread, and I've got so many variations on this particular um, artisan bread. I have an overnight recipe where if you didn't have time to bake the same day, you can mix it in the evening and bake it in the morning. Um, if you were wanting a bread in a quicker time, um, I'm actually planning on putting that recipe up very soon, um, which is what we're making. It basically has more yeast, so it rises more quickly and uh, you can bake it in a few hours rather than waiting 12 hours to have it rise. Um, how long does this have to bake now for and what time uh, here? Um, it is baking for 30 minutes at 425 minutes. Let me put my timer on before I forget to do that. So it bakes for 30 minutes at 425 degrees Fahrenheit and in your preheated pot. Once the 30 minutes is over, you remove the pot, you take the lid off, and then you put the pot back in without the lid and that um, it'll brown the bread on the top and finish baking on the inside. But um, and that at that point, you either you can go from another five to another 20 minutes based on your personal preference on what the color of the bread that you want to eat to be. Um, I like a light golden bread. So usually I only do another 10 minutes. 
My mom, on the other hand, likes like a darker colored crust. So she will leave hers in for another like 15, 20 minutes until like, she gets a really deep brown color on her bread. So when you do that additional time for the browning, when you remove the lid off the Dutch oven, it doesn't, does that impact the texture on the inside of the bread as well? Uh, not really. It, no. it just, um, at that point, your bread is mostly done baking. And um, if you leave it in for too long, it can, it can brown, like it can get a little bit too dense on the inside or too dry. Um, but with the amount of hydration that I use in my dough, it, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. If you have a drier dough to begin with, it could, it could make it very dense. Okay. Well, we're getting ready to wrap up. So one more thing that I ask everybody, if your home studying experience with one word, what would it be? My home studying experience in one word, I would say, eye-opening I would say eye-opening I haven't heard that one before yeah I would say that the way that our um society works and thinks and the way mainstream everything is you just assume that the things that you that you are presented you, most people take that at face value um the things that are healthy are healthy the things that are unhealthy are unhealthy but when you really dig deeper into it, you realize that things aren't necessarily as it seems. And the deeper you go into your homesteading journey, the more you, you learn about how things could really be better than, than how they are. And I feel like as the years have gone by, every year I have had those moments of just having eye-opening moments of just, wow, I had no idea that this was so much different than what it could be. You, True. You, you know I what agree. I mean? <laughs> I totally agree. The longer you do it, the more you learn, the more you see into things. It's totally true. Yeah. So Kira, thank you so much for joining me today. I totally appreciate it and have a great day. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye.